Welcome to Good News, being brought to you by Listening for Clues. We are Lauren Welch and John Shemitek, deacons in the Episcopal Diocese of Maryland. We sure are. And today we have some good news brought to you from Slick St. Luke's Youth Center. And our special guest today is Amanda Gardner Talbot, who is the executive director of St. Luke's Youth Center, a nonprofit organization in West Baltimore. Slick empowers and employs local residents to develop programs that address the specific needs of their community. Slick fosters civic engagement, advances education, creates economic opportunities, and nurtures individuals' self-direction. Amanda is a Baltimore City native. She has strong connections to the city and to the Episcopal Diocese of Maryland. Her grandparents, Annie and Ed, helped establish the Church of the Guardian Angels food pantry and thrift shop, and her father, Van, served as dean of the Cathedral of the Incarnation in Baltimore. And I will add, Amanda, that Van was the beloved dean of the cathedral for a number of years. Welcome, Amanda. It's so good to have you with us today. It is good to be here. Thank you for having me, John and Lauren. We are really happy to have you, Amanda. And before we get to everything you're doing today with Slick, tell us how Slick began. Sure. So Slick began out of programming that had been taking place in St. Luke's, West Baltimore on Cary Street for decades. The congregation there had dwindled over the years. And my dad, when he left the cathedral, went to St. Luke's to support in mission and community. And so he asked me as a teacher at the time, a public school teacher, to come and support with the community engagement by starting a summer camp. So I met with the school, and this was in 2015. I met with the leadership at the local elementary middle school, Franklin Square Elementary Middle. And out of that meeting, the social worker helped us develop a program that's an arts integrated camp called Camp Imagination. We inspire a love in reading and writing through the visual and performing arts. So it's a program that started a one week out of the year. It was actually connected to the reading camps that are throughout the diocese. And since then we have grown immensely. We became a 501c3. Unfortunately, during the pandemic, St. Luke's Church was closed as a worshiping community, but Slick has continued to thrive. I was teaching at the school for a while. That's when parents in the community became a part of it and really have taken over the leadership of the work. And I have since left my teaching career and community school coordinator career to focus on Slick full time. So that's our beginning. Well, wow. so Amanda, can you tell me a bit about kind of the population that you serve for folks who may not be familiar with West Baltimore, because we do have kind of a nationwide and even international audience these days. Can you just describe a little bit about the situation that, that these young people find themselves in? Sure, sure. So Slick St. Luke's is located in Poppleton, which is a neighborhood in Southwest Baltimore, adjacent to Franklin Square. We are just west of MLK Boulevard for our locals and south of the highway to nowhere. So we are in a community that is in the inner city and has experienced a lot of challenges over the years and decades. Our families that we serve, and it's, you know, I don't even want to say we serve our families. Our families run the program. So our families and youth come from generational poverty, the impacts of under-resourced communities. We have families who have experienced so much in their life and had so many challenges and yet are able to thrive in so many ways. They have so many aspirations for themselves and their families. And yet, because of the lack of financial resources, 
and the lack of access to good education and opportunities are not able to achieve the things in life that they really would like to see for themselves and their children. And so what Slick has become under the leadership of the families as a place that removes those barriers and bridges the gap of access to resources. So that families who want to pursue education, who want their children to do various things, that they get those opportunities. And so, yeah, the population we're dealing with are people who have a lot of passion and heart and not a lot of access. So Amanda, how do you help them find the access? When I started working in West Baltimore, I'd been a teacher in Anne Arundel County for about 12 years. And when I was teaching there, I was able to do what I was taught to do. I was able to apply that and the majority of my children were meeting grade level expectations. When I arrived to West Baltimore to teach there, it became very clear to me that the children in that community are perfectly capable of achieving the same academic outcomes, but they're, they weren't. And I was the same teacher. I had the same background and expertise that I did in Anne Arundel County. But because of the children having so much that they've dealt with around poverty and trauma, that really I needed to focus from purely academics, health, safety, social, emotional. And there are so many resources that families and individuals need in order to thrive in those ways. I think as someone who came from a family with financial resources and access, all of those foundational things were met. So when I showed up at school, I could take in the information because I knew that I was going to have a meal when I got home. I knew I wasn't worried about the safety of myself or my family. So I felt like I had a special ability with my access and my privileges to open up doors, not for people, but just connect people, connect resources, and not from the perspective of what I saw the community needed, but what the community are saying that they need. So. So that's great, Amanda. I'm hearing a a very significant thread as you're talking about your experience with Slick around relationships. Can you tell us if there were any specific challenges around gaining trust? Because you were coming from outside the community. This is culturally, you know, something that you may not have had direct experience with yourself. And so how how did that play out for you? Yeah, so it's interesting. I grew up in Baltimore City. I went to Baltimore City Public Schools. And by high school, I was often the only white girl in a class. And so I often have found myself throughout my life and career of being in spaces where I am actually the minority. And I think that taught me early on that, you know, everyone has individual experiences in life and stories to tell and share. And I think that I approach things with a very curious demeanor because I am, I wanna understand. I wanna understand why it is that I grew up in the border between Guilford and Greenmount and there was a literal wall there with people who had resources and people who were obviously struggling to access resources in my own community why it was when I continued my education through middle and high school, there were fewer and fewer white kids coming to school. They were going off to the private schools. And so I I saw the inequity, I felt the inequity, but I didn't experience the negative of that inequity. And so I think when I started working in West Baltimore and And I went there intentionally to understand why it was that these kids I had met and families I had met through St. Luke's 
why it was that these kids were not meeting grade level expectations. What is going on? These kids are so bright and these parents are so caring and passionate. And so, so I think, and I can't speak for other people, but I recognize the fact that there are so much more that I don't know than things that I do know. And that has helped me build the strongest relationships of, of trust. I think a lot of people in that community trust me like I trust them. And they trust you because you saw that they knew what they needed you weren't imposing something on them. So that trust was able to be built. I think that that is a gift that you bring to these families. Has anything surprised you in this adventure that you've been on with these families? Everything. I mean, you know, everything that you learn that's new is surprising in good ways and bad ways and confusing ways. I didn't necessarily go into teaching in West Baltimore with this humble approach to the teaching part because I had come into West Baltimore with a solid foundation in teaching. I knew my craft. I knew I was successful in it. And so when I started teaching and it wasn't working, it Mm -hmm. was just mind blowing to me. I was like, what is happening here? And that's when I said, you know what, I don't know what to do and who does. The other teachers didn't either because they were having the same struggles. I mean, you look at the numbers. I mean, everyone is having these challenges. And when I talked to the parents and the parents started to tell me their stories, when I got to know the kids and the kids were telling me their stories, I, I recognize there's so much underlying that foundational need that I can't relate to. So the experts in how to fix communities of poverty are the people who are living in poverty. They're the ones who have the answers. And if those of us who have the resources just kind of listen and follow their lead, amazing things happen. This is actually amazing. And I think one of the things that's amazing is this is a very common theme that we're finding with people we're talking to that are doing incredible good works in the world is that listening is one of the major keys to making things better. I wonder, Amanda, can you talk a little bit about what this experience at Slick has meant to you personally? How has it affected your inner life or your spiritual life as you've kind of gone through these experiences? Yeah. So if anyone listening is from the cathedral, they probably know me as a child. And I went to confirmation classes when I was 13. And I remember deciding at that point that I didn't want to get confirmed. I went to my dad and I said, I don't really know that this is for me. I know I have faith. I have some belief. I don't know that this structure of the Episcopal Church is a fit for me. And my dad respected that. And so I stopped going to church. And when I wound up helping my dad in West Baltimore to start this community engagement, and I was there helping with the camp, that became an after-school program, that became family events and all of these things, I started to see and hear the realities of people in that community. And I recognized that whereas I might have had a a kind of insecure faith, you know, I didn't have to rely on my faith because I had choices and options in my life and resources and connections. People who don't have those things have unwavering faith. Our families who have been through more than I can possibly imagine have the the confidence of faith that I would see in like my dad and the people who were very committed to their faith in the church. And that's when I recognized and when I was teaching in West Baltimore, when I did everything that I knew and I was pooling all the resources and connection that I had and nothing was working, I was like, all I can do is pray. Like, that's it. That's all that's left. And sure enough, when you, when you start to kind of like 
give into that and accept the vulnerability of that, then you start to see all the miracles around you. You start to see that, you know, this mom who works six out of seven days a week and still lives in poverty with five children, two fathers have died of gun violence in the city. She still gets up every day. She gets those kids to school. They're fed. She has hope. She has dreams. I mean, if that's not faith and miracle, I mean, I don't know what else is. I would eat kids at Slick. Do you go to church? And they say, yeah, every day, except for Sunday, you know? And I'm like, well, I go to church. You know, I go to church. This is my church. My church is the community. And, and so, yeah, that's really the biggest awakening that I've had in working in this community is I've really found a confident faith and I've began to recognize the value of the institution of church as a space for me to just go sometimes. I church hop. I'll show up and I just go and I focus on my connection directly as opposed to usually there's a lot of noise and things around me and I can kind of find that quiet space in church. As a kid, it was an obligation. <laughs> but now as an adult, it's a choice. So, so yeah, it's been a really interesting path for me. And I, I definitely give my dad props. I don't know how many priests would say, sure, don't get confirmed. You don't have to go to church. I get it. A wise one does, though, and your dad is going to be right. <laughs> no question. No question. So, Amanda, I, I know that you're working on a project in the next couple of weeks, Camp Imagination. Mm -hmm. Would you like to tell us something about that? Yeah, I'd love to. So, like I said, Camp Imagination is an arts integrated camp. We actually are running five, well, six total weeks. Camp Imagination is five weeks, starting on Monday, July 3rd. And then the last week of it, we partner with Children's Peace Center, which was another nonprofit started in the diocese at the cathedral. And they have a camp at Claggett called All God's Children. So all of the kids that are age appropriate come out and they're either campers or counselors for that last week. So it's total of a six week experience. The first two weeks are going to be at the Cathedral of the Incarnation, and then we'll be at the Church of the Guardian Angel for the last three weeks of the Camp Imagination part. So that part's a day camp. But we'll have 40-some kids of all ages. We enroll families, not kids, So and it's for life. So our kids grow up with us. They're always with us. And some of our, our older ones will be youth workers working for the camp, and our younger ones are, are the campers. So we'll have arts integrated workshops where professional artists work with the kids in the morning. Then they have choice time in the afternoon where they get to do different activities and food and snacks and community and lots of fun. So it'll be good. Can you share just a little bit of how important the arts and music are to any child, but especially to these children? Yeah, when Camp Imagination was developed, the conversation with the, the school staff, and in particular the social worker, who's still on our board, she's amazing, was all about, well, what are the academic needs, reading at the time, and what motivates kids to want to read, and what do the kids like to do? And they love music, and movement, and creativity, and curiosity and fun. And so we decided to do the arts integration. I think another element of that is unfortunately, a lot of our public schools in the city don't have a strong cultural arts or resource curriculum. So they're not getting that level of engagement in the arts during the school year. So it's a way to really give them that experience because we like to give them the experience in different types of art forms. So it'll be visual art, drama, spoken word poetry, and music. And the kids, you start to see after the first couple of weeks, they start to gravitate towards one or two. And then we kind of focus on really giving them more time with those particular artists. And that motivates them like in the, the drama, they're writing, they're writing to write their scripts in music, they're writing their music reading out loud, expression, confidence. It's really a great way to teach literacy to kids 
is through the arts, through anything motivating to them. They can yeah. learn that it's fun, right? <laughs> yeah. 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 They're not teaching them anything. They're just learning, which is yeah. great. That's way to learn. Yeah, and it's making a difference. Camp Imagination's about to start very soon. If there are folks that are interested in knowing more about that or supporting it in some way or maybe helping out at the day camp, is there is that is there a need right now? And then once this time passes, how can folks really help you and work with you and, and the community, the families at Slick to to keep this work going? So first of all, help us with Camp Imagination. What what can people do with that? Yeah, so I'll ha- I'd be happy to send you a link to our website. It's www.bemoreslick.org, B-M-O-R-E-S-L-Y-C.org. We do have a tab for Camp Imagination which gives information, and I think the volunteer sign-up link is there. We are looking for people who are interested in coming and help prepare and serve breakfast and lunch. And anyone who wants to come by, just visit, play with kids, get to know the families who are running it. We're all about building authentic relationships that don't have a power dynamic. We want to engage where people are truly interested in getting to know us because we're truly interested in getting to know you. And then the second part to your question was continuing that engagement. Yes. Yeah. So people ask me all the time, people from different spaces and communities that want to come and help in West Baltimore. And I say to them to just show up and listen. And then somewhere along the line, as you grow those relationships, you will hear and see and feel where your your special gifts fit into the needs. And I I love to see when people come up, they'll say, you know, can I come and volunteer? Great. Yeah. Come volunteer. Come hang out. Come have dinner with us. Next school year, we're going to do monthly community dinner. So we'd invite everyone to come out and just have dinner with us. And then if you want to come volunteer, you can come and do something that we tell you to do, but you could also just come and play games with kids or bring something you're passionate about. If you love chess, and play chess with kids, they're going to wind up loving chess. If you're into horticulture, you're going to find at least like five kids there that want to be, you know, farmers by the time you're done. Um, So when people bring themselves, their authentic selves, it's contagious and it's, it's powerful. So that's how we like people to engage. And if people want to engage in that way, once again, it's our website has all the information on how to contact us. Darlene Clark, our engagement coordinator, we call her grandma. She is the one that you will end up speaking to and she will invite you in. And someone has described her as a human hug. So she's a warm person. Although to the kids, you can tell who's in trouble because they're sitting on either side of grandma at any given moment looking really upset. And grandma's just sitting there. So yeah, so yeah, come hang out. We are right now, yeah, we're doing a lot and we're growing. We don't even have a space right now. We're having to commute back and forth to different churches. St. James is housing us. So, you know, it's been challenging, but there's always ways people can find that they fit into the mix. And I'm sure you have need for financial resources as yeah. well. Yes, and, we do. And is that also accessible on your website? Is that right? It is. It is. We employ community parents in the community to do the work. What we're striving to do is to give a livable, sustainable wage and employ as many community members as possible to do this work. And so, no, a lot of times when people donate, they don't want money to go outside of programming, but know that all the money that's donated to SLIC, I am the only one who does not live in that community. And it is helping families disrupt a cycle of generational poverty that has existed. So it's really just by employing each staff member, it's life-changing for them. And so I understand St. Luke's is no longer a worship space, but is there some plan for the physical campus or location? Yeah, it's really exciting. It has been challenging and a bit scary, (laughs) but I'm excited. So St. Luke's Church was shut down as a worshiping congregation during the pandemic. And Slick had gotten our 501c3 by then, so we were able to continue. 
we started discussions at that point with the Episcopal Diocese to allow us to stay and allow us to develop it as a community, a space in the vision that the community needs it to be for them. So that's the church and the clergy house. We started on the path of having the community lead the plans for that process. And then we found out last October that the building was not structurally sound. So we, St. James Lafayette Square has taken us in for the after school program and provided us with a bus to use for transportation, a van. So we've been doing that. And in the meantime, we now have a 20 year lease with the Episcopal Diocese of Maryland that allows us to continue this community-led redevelopment of the campus into a campus of art, education, and opportunity in West Baltimore. Mm -hmm. It will be a landmark of repair and renewal in a community that has endured so much harm. The church itself is the size of, it's larger than the cathedral. It fits a thousand people and it's falling apart. And that's going to become a space for events, to share the history of the community, to share the history of the church. The clergy house, which is a, a small school building size, that's going to be a space for slick programming and other nonprofits to house the work. So we're working in collaboration with organizations in the area like Southwest Partnership, United Way, and community associations to really see this plan through and have it be a place where the community really, they already feel it's their home and they want to save it. They want to see this. So really help bring those resources to support the community and seeing this through. So it's an exciting project and we've, we've gotten started. So it's a good thing. Amanda, <laughs> we've talked about a lot this afternoon. Is there anything else you'd like to share about the work you're doing, about what it means to you and, and your community? Yeah, you thank you. So, yes, I would like to say to all the Episcopal churches that support us or that do the work of mission and community engagement, that there is so much opportunity, I think, for churches and nonprofits to work together to uplift one another and to continue down a journey together. And I think it was very sad to me that St. Luke's was shut as a worshiping congregation. And my understanding is it's happened other times, like with Paul's Place and other nonprofits, where it starts as a mission of a church and then things happen and the worshiping congregation dwindles, the mission grows, and then the mission leaves. And I don't want to see that happen anymore. I feel very strongly that strong churches can support strong nonprofits and, and vice versa. Nonprofits don't always have to be the recipient of things like money from churches. We could be in partnership to do other things, to do programming together, to raise funds to help support property development plans and sustainability. I am determined to show that Slick and St. Luke's Youth Center can continue to be a strong part of this diocese, even though we do not have worship. We are a community of unwavering faith and belief and blessings. And so we are very connected to the churches and they feel connected to us. I think that moving forward, continuing to build these relationships with churches and communities is really valuable for all of us. Thank you. Thanks so much, Amanda. You are a blessing to the church. You're a blessing to the community. Slick's a blessing to the community. And we very much appreciate your spending the time to be with us today. Tell us all about it. And uh, we will have links in the show notes for folks that want to get in touch with you, learn more about the programs, or find ways to help support the mission of Slick. So once again, Amanda, thank you so much for being here. Thank you both. It's been a joy. Anytime. Happy to come back anytime. Thank you. <laughs> and we also want to thank our listeners and our viewers today. We cannot do this without you. Please take a moment to comment, like, and share on all your social media platforms. And until next time.
peace and blessings. Good News is being brought to you by Listening for Clues. You can find us on our website, listeningforclues.com, our YouTube channel, our Vimeo channel, and just about every podcast platform that there is. Hope to see you soon.